Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives. And today's crazy. It's going to be a lot like yesterday's crazy. Sorry, General Powell. Anyway, we're going to start with the good martini. And Americans are on to the mainstream media. A new Gallup poll shows that basically we're at an all-time low in Americans trusting or having a great deal or even a fair amount of trust in the media, just 32% of Americans say that. When you break it down by political affiliation, 51% of Democrats trust the media, 14% of Republicans, and only 30% of independents. And Jim, when you go back to, say, the 2000 election, 53% Democrats, 47% uh, Republicans, so there wasn't even that big of a divide then. As you get to other presidential elections, it gets less and less trustworthy in the minds of both Republicans and Democrats. Interestingly, older Americans, who are generally more conservative, uh, trust the media more, but only at 38 percent. 18 to 49 year olds only at 26 percent. So the media is not objective and the American people have caught on. That's good news. You know, it's not just the lack of objectivity uh, that, that I think drives people bonkers, Greg. It's also like. Like objective is not the same as fairness, right? right? I, I, you know, you and I are not objective. We have viewpoints. We're very clear about our viewpoints. We are men of the right, but I'd like to think we try to be relatively fair. Meaning, if there is exculpatory evidence for a Democrat we don't like, uh, we at least point it out. We acknowledge it. If there's another side of the story, we'll at least point to it, even if we don't find it terribly compelling or credible. And you know, there are certain things that are just indefensible, like you know, Harry Reid. <laughs> um, but I, kind of, you know, I, I was just thinking about it. I have a piece that's on the editor's desk it'll be on National Review uh, probably later today I'm just using a, a good example of this uh, Greg you remember when like Time Magazine had Bob Dole on the cover and said is Dole too old for the job Yes. and we all remember all the things that were said about John McCain I went back and I checked there was actually a McClatchy wire service headline that said voters think McCain is too old and wrinkly for the job <laughs> wrinkly Right. You know, now imagine either of those headlines going with Hillary Clinton this year. You'd never you'd never see it. You know, in fact, the Daily Beast, Eleanor Clift, Michael Tomaski, all these folks have said, no, no, that's ageist. You're attacking her for her age. It's completely unfair. Now, Hillary Clinton's going to be 69 on Election Day. Dole and McCain were 72. I guess, you know, as, as Chris Saliza suggested, those three years make a really huge difference. You know, 69, you're still young and sprightly and fine. But once you're 72, ugh, then you're crazy. <laughs> a lot of us would look at this and say, you know, what it, the, the lesson of this from most of the mainstream media is, is how old is too old to be president? Republican. <laughs> Good point. Good point. I would point out that Bob Dole's still alive, by the way, 20 years later. Amazing. Yeah, it's just not fair. It's not objective. The story selection, I think, is a big part of it as well. And the things they'll just drone on and on and on about uh, is just uh, becoming more and more obvious. And, you know, we, we, we debated putting a, a story in the Good Martini about millennials being wary of Hillary Clinton. It looks like from these numbers with the younger Americans, they're wary of the, the mainstream media as well. It's not like we're letting millennials off the hook, but it looks, looks like they're paying attention more than we might have thought before. Yeah, but this is not entirely all a good phenomenon, uh, Greg, because I think that once you decide, ah, the media lies all the time, the media is full of nonsense. Like our, our argument would be not that the media lies. It would be that the media gives you half the story, right? That they emphasize certain aspects of the story. Whatever you hear Republican lawmaker says, and there's some sort of like silly, crazy, controversial thing. If it has a Republican lawmaker, chances are you've never heard of that person. And it's a state lawmaker way out in the middle of nowhere, some state. And you've never heard of this person. They just got elected and they're kind of known as this, you know, nut job or gadfly or something. But that becomes national news because it's really, really important. Every Republican had to address the things that were said by uh, Todd Aiken. There you go. Todd Aiken or, or something like that. Whereas, a, a, you know, other Democratic figures are not seen as representative. You're not held. A, no, no other Democrat is held accountable for the sort of things that, say, Alan Grayson says. Um, and it's that kind of double standard that drives us crazy. But if you end up with this, ah, the media is full of lies. I feel like Greg, it's a very short step to Alex Jones world. <laughs> where they're covering up the lizard people and Area 51 and black helicopters and all that kind of stuff. I kind of like once you reject 
the coverage of what's going on in the world. It's kind of choose your own reality, uh, which I think can lead to other you know major problems for the country and for the electorate. Oh, it certainly can. False flag. Everything's a false there flag. There we go. Exactly. <laughs> That's just what they want you to believe, Greg. <laughs> they. They, yes. All right, on to the bad martini now, and uh, we don't talk about Rush Limbaugh a ton on this podcast, but uh, he, of course, is still, I believe, the most listened to radio host, uh, and he has a a strong audience, and he's believed to be one of the more conservative figures in media. Uh, He has been kind of all over the map on Donald Trump throughout this uh, campaign, but uh, yesterday he was taking some calls on Trump's proposed uh, maternity leave plan, six weeks guaranteed paid maternity leave. And he says that, that he would pay for that by rooting out waste, fraud and abuse in the government. So we can rest easy that that'll happen. Uh, but uh, so Rush Limbaugh takes a, a caller who basically says, I'm a small government guy, but why don't we just stop spending money on you know different grants and, and oddball research projects? And this one actually takes care of the family. So this one's this one's better. So uh, Limbaugh talks about how we're at a crossroads here between ideology and pragmatic politics. And then he got into this, which is uh, potentially disturbing on a couple different levels. Do you think the argument over big versus small government still going on? Or do you think it's over? And if you think it's over, who won? How many people do you know whose vote is predicated largely or maybe totally on which candidate swears to get government out of as much of life as possible. And who is that candidate? I would maintain to you that in this cycle, we have two candidates representing two major parties, neither of which is conservative. So, Jim, I think it's fair to say that in recent years, uh, small government people have certainly been losing the battle. The size of government, the size of debt is e- explosive. But the idea that we should quit and that we've lost and it's not worth fighting anymore ought to trouble every conservative. Well, I mean, two observations here. First, let's begin by preface by saying no matter what happens in this election cycle or what comes forward, I think we're always going to love Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh could like suddenly get hit on the head and start talking like Michael Moore tomorrow. <laughs> And he still will have done more for conservatism than almost anybody else alive today. So uh, despite whatever disagreements we're having with what he's having these days, this is still a man who, you know, we all have deep underlying respect for. With that in mind, the, obviously Russia sounded a little bit different this cycle. And when he's saying stuff like, look, what, you know, what, what Trump is saying is, is pretty popular and this is what you got to do to get elected and stuff like that. I don't know about you, Greg. I remember when this was like, that was the kind of thing people would say to explain Arlen Specter <laughs> or Charlie Crist or, or, you know, like that was what the rhinos said, right? You know, that, look, this stuff is popular. We got to vote for it. Otherwise, we'll lose stuff like raising the minimum wage or uh, various entitlement spending, Bush and Medicare Part D, adding prescription drug, med- you know, for to Medicare. Um, so, so kind of the question becomes, if you're a conservative voice in media, and you're not an official campaign spokesman, what is your role? What is your job? And I think you've seen a very big difference amongst conservative media voices this cycle. If Rush looks at these two and says, look, Trump's got to say this stuff to get elected, uh, as far as social spending or a new entitlement goes, the idea of giving uh, six weeks of unemployment benefits to any woman uh, who's just given birth is not that bad. Yeah, I, I can see that, but this is all entitlement programs start this way. You know, they always seem like a nice idea at the beginning, the sort of thing you'd want to do to help somebody out. Um, And this is how we have the giant entitlement problem. Uh, The other thing, I'm going to make one little minor correction to what you said there, Greg. We say, oh, you know, we haven't won the the fight in um, uh, on the idea of shrinking government. Well, two things. One, if you look at what Obama has proposed in terms of spending and in terms of what actually has been enacted in spending since Republicans took over the House in 2010, I believe you get something larger than the total spending on Medicare. Meaning that, you know, in terms of what Obama has wanted and what Obama has gotten in terms of spending increases, there is a giant difference. Now, you can argue about whether it's enough or whether, you know, the debt is still going up or things like that. But it's it's not correct to say the House Republicans have not had an impact on spending levels. Uh, As a portion of the GDP, the, the deficit is actually shrinking. The debt is still going up. 
And unfortunately, a good portion of the electorate thinks those two words are interchangeable when they're not. <laughs> um, so there's that aspect, coupled with the fact that also you look at almost every Republican governor, they've actually done a pretty good job of, of, of controlling spending, certainly more than any Democrat governor would be. So I don't feel like the cause of fiscal conservatism is lost. If Trump is elected, which is actually looking a little bit more likely, you know, day by day and week by week, poll by poll, and you're a conservative. If you know, are, are you going to hold Trump's feet to the fire or have we just kind of decided we are all, you know, Nixon once said we're all Keynesians now. We're all OK with big spending as long as our guy's doing it. And um, if that's if that's the decision, stop the bus. I'm off. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not ready to give up on that. Uh, but I think you're going to see some very serious fights in conservative ranks about that. What do you do? Uh, when you have a, a Republican president who, who is calling for more spending. And it's worth noting, George, George W. Bush was not a down-the-line fiscal conservative. Spending went up quite a bit under him. Some yeah. of it was military. Some of it was constructing uh, homeland security and things like that. But he was not a you know, down-the-line fiscal conservative. You know, when people are hurting, the government's got to move, as he said in 2000. Um, now, I think a lot of conservatives look at that and say, look, we had a war to fight. It was after 9-11. We weren't going to, you know, give a we weren't going to hit uh, George W. Bush when some ninny like, you know, Michael Moore was fighting him. And I always kind of wondered if the Tea Party in 2008, 2009, 2010 was kind of this like delayed reaction to that. <laughs> you know, we recognized, oh, wait a minute. We forgot about fiscal conservatism again. But looks like we're forgetting it again, Greg. So. <laughs> Apparently, it's like apparently so. Couple, yeah, to, every fifteen minutes we remember we're supposed to control spending. To answer your question, if they're not holding Trump's feet to the fire now, and he actually wins, the same people who are uh, carrying his water now will carry his water then too. You can, you can take that to the bank. But uh, hopefully, as we have stated earlier in the podcast, we will be fair uh, about it and uh, and hold the feet to the fire if, if we get to that point. So, all right. Yesterday we talked about some of the first emails uh, divulged from the hacking of Colin Powell's email. Jim, that seemed pretty tame now, uh, 24 hours. In, in, in hindsight, I actually mentioned, uh, wow, Colin Powell actually keeps himself pretty well under control, probably more than most people when uh, when they send emails that they don't think the whole world is going to get to see. Uh, turns out that's not always the case. Uh, there's a few different emails here that we're having some fun with. Uh, first of all, they're in talking about Hillary Clinton and the email server. Powell had claimed Clinton's, quote, minions repeatedly said that they are making a mistake trying to drag me in. Yet they still try. The media isn't fooled and she's getting crucified. The differences are profound and they know it. So he's very frustrated that Hillary kept trying to say, ah, I was just doing what Colin Powell did. Uh, Then there's also this exchange with uh, Democratic donor Jeffrey Leeds, who points out in March of 2015 that Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse told him that Hillary Clinton had trouble climbing the stairs to the podium stage. Uh, So that's obviously raising some eyebrows, given what happened in recent days with Hillary Clinton. And, of course, the one that is getting the most attention. I'm going to do my best Gene Rayburn from the match game here, Jim. A 70-year-old person with a long track record, this is about Hillary, unbridled ambition, greedy, not transformational, with a husband still blanking bimbos at home, according to the New York Post. So, Jim, a lot of stuff he's saying there that a lot of other people probably say in private about the Clintons. What do you make of all this? I don't know about you, Greg, but if you if let's let's assume that the last allegation there that he is still blanking bimbos behind closed doors at age seventy, you're kind of impressed. Um, no. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying, you know, in terms of health of the pre, we're talking about the Hillary's health and things like that. I know? see where you're going. Yes. Yes, you know, you know, you know, maybe Bob Dole shouldn't be doing those commercials anymore. <laughs> um, uh, you can take the you can take the dog out of the man. You can't take the man out of the dog. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, you know, that's an interesting rumor, and it kind of confirms everyone's deep suspicion that Bill Clinton is still the same man. He always was. Nothing has changed. You know, we, we had said yesterday, kind of the, one of the, the funny jokes about this was that, uh, you know, Colin Powell's emails get hacked, and everything he's saying in private pretty much matches up with what he was saying in public. And then we got this batch. <laughs> Then we got to the good stuff. Um, and this is kind of interesting. You know, I, it's interesting that he noticed something about Hillary's health uh, or having trouble getting around or something like that. Um, the idea that he's, you know, uh, infuriated that he's being dragged into this and the idea that he's turned into the scapegoat is not the least bit sli- uh, surprising. It is indicating, interesting to see just how much he seems to disdain her character um, and how much she is this, uh, this, you know, this ambitious and voracious. I think we said yesterday that the slogan would be "Everything she touches, she ruins," or, or something like that. Yeah. This is an, an intriguing uh, bit of revelations. There, I really would like to ask Colin Powell who's going to vote for. Her. Pretty obviously, it's not going to be Trump, but he doesn't sound like he's a terribly big fan of Hillary Clinton. So, you know, 
who knows? Maybe there'll be some big endorsement for uh, Gary Johnson or, or Evan McMullen. I, I think it's safe to say he's not going Jill Stein, but we'll wait and see. <laughs> Could be. A couple different thoughts here. Uh, first of all, there's the other juicy email that surprised no one, and that's apparently that Hillary still hates Obama because of what happened in 2008. I'm sure that shocked everyone. Uh, also, Jim, you know, 2016 is the year that uh, a lot of people's favorite celebrities are dying. Um, this it could be the year that email dies between Hillary's emails huh. and uh, and Colin Powell's emails. People are just not even going to communicate anymore. You know that kind of makes sense. Maybe it is. Maybe this is the in 2017 the end of email. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I would be kind of intrigued by this. I would uh, I would kind of interested to see what that world would be like. Probably not a good idea for a guy who writes an email newsletter to speculate about this. <laughs> Don't worry, America. The morning jolt is not hackable. <laughs> what a crazy year, Jim. Talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And be sure to tune in again on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.